Welcome to this online service at City of Hope. And we're going to spend some time this morning in, in Matthew chapter 10 in the, in the passage. And Jesus called to him in verse 1, 12 disciples and gave them authority. Can you say Jesus called to him? And gave them authority. And the authority was specific. He said authority over unclean spirits or demons and to cast them out, and to heal every disease. Can you say disease? disease? And every affliction. Now the word for affliction in the Greek is, is disability. Okay, we're going to get to that in a moment. And God is saying, I want you to own your assignment. You are on this earth, not by chance, but you are here on purpose and for a purpose. You are here by divine design. You were born for such a time as this, and you were set in such a place as this. You are here not by accident, or like some people say, accident, but you are here on purpose. I have determined that you would live. You are destined for greatness. You are here because I've got an assignment for your life. I've got a calling on your life, and you will never be fulfilled until there's alignment to my assignment for your life. And God is bringing about an alignment to the assignment that He has for your life in this day and age. You see, up to this very point, the disciples were only that. They were disciples, and we all should be disciples of Jesus. What is it as a disciple? A disciple is a learner or a follower of Jesus. Jesus called them. The first time He engaged them, He said, come follow me and I will make you become something that you're not yet but that you're destined to be and that is fishes of men. So there was an initial calling into discipleship. How many of you have been following Jesus for maybe five or ten years? Come on. Where's the ten years? How many of you follow Jesus for more than ten years? Maybe twenty years. Okay. And so you've been following God for some years. You've been a disciple of Jesus. You've been learning all you can. It's exactly what happened here to the disciples. But in this very moment, in Matthew 10 verse 1, the disciples become apostles. And there's a difference between a disciple and an apostle. And, and I'm not one for carrying titles. That's why in this church we don't have apostle and bishop and senior bishop. You know, some, I find some pastors, they've got more titles before their name than members in their church. Okay? So we're not into titles. But you know, the meaning of apostle is sent one. God has a plan and a purpose for you. You're not just here to make money, but to make a difference. You're not just here to, to, to survive, but to thrive in the assignment that God has on your life. Wow. And I believe this morning is a watershed moment where disciples are going to become apostolic, where God is saying, um, yes, you have followed me. Yes, you've been faithful. Now I am sending you. I love spy movies. I love the James Bond movies. I love this, the... the, the um, Mission Impossible movies, and oftentimes countries like, like Russia or America would place a sleeping agent in another country. They would leave that agent there for 10, 20 years. They would live a normal life with a normal family, but the whole family will be agents, sleeping agents, and then one day the CIA will decide, now we are activating that asset in that country, and their mission begins. Many of us have been sleeping agents of the kingdom. God has been preparing us. We have been following Jesus. God has been training us. We have been equipped, and God is saying, today is the day that I'm activating every sleeping agent. I am activating my assets. I am activating my assets in Kimberley. And God is saying, disciples today are going to become sent ones. Come on, turn to your neighbor and say, you're on a mission, my brother. You're on a mission, my sister. In Matthew 11, the reference is wrong, but in Matthew 11, it says, Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Who's the greatest of all the Old Testament heroes? John the? Who's greater than Father Abram? John the, of all, of, of, among those born of women since the day of Adam, nobody is greater than? So who's greater than David, and Moses, and Abram, and Joshua, and Daniel, John the Baptist? Why? Because John the Baptist announces the coming of the kingdom of God. And then he says, yet the one who is the least in the kingdom 
of heaven is greater than John the Baptist. The one who carries the smallest, seemingly most insignificant assignment in my father's kingdom, even him or her, is greater than John, who's the greatest of all the Old Testament heroes. You see, when you and I accept and own our assignment in God's kingdom, we become great in God's kingdom. We become even greater than all our Bible heroes. And you may think your task is as a teacher or God has called you as a lawyer or as a doctor or as a personal trainer or God has called you to work at, at the bank or in the court or God has called you to work wherever, whatever sector of society. That is, that is your career. That is where God's going to use you. But God has put you on an assignment in that place. You've been a sleeper agent in that environment. And God is saying, I am activating you right now with your kingdom assignment this morning. And your assignment, this is all of our assignment, is to manifest heaven on earth until earth begins to look more like heaven. To manifest heaven in that classroom, in that school, in that courtroom, in that business place, in that university wherever you go, is to manifest heaven in that place until that place begins to look more like heaven. And from that time of John the Baptist, since the time he began preaching until now, Jesus says the kingdom of heaven has been forcefully advancing and violent or forceful people are attacking it. That sounds vicious. It sounds like war. And yes, it's been used out of context amongst others by the crusaders hundreds of years ago. They said, we're going to force people to accept Christ and the British Empire. And so they went throughout Europe and Northern Africa, and by sword, they have forced people to become Christian or they would kill them. And it's kind of left the church and the, and the, and the Christian community with a very bad rep amongst the Muslim community in Northern Africa. Many Muslims will tell you, how can a God of love sanction that? But what does the scripture mean? I love the, the way the Amplified translated. It doesn't say violent people or violent men. It says energetic men and women advances the kingdom of God with energy. Come on, when you and I own our assignment, there is an energy re released in our life. There's power released within us. And so I just quickly want to give you five things that happen when we own our assignment. Five things that's going to happen and I don't have a lot of time. The first thing is, when you own your assignment, your assignment comes with authority. Can you say authority? authority. Jesus called the twelve, and he said, I give you authority to cast out demons, diseases, and disabilities. And in the verse later, he says, even death. You see, your assignment comes with specific authority to deal with stuff. To deal with demons. To deal with diseases. Dis dis disabilities, and even death. Jesus gives us authority because all of these things are illegal squatters. In South Africa, we know what that means, okay? And so there's certain neighborhoods that have been set aside by the government where people can put up formal or informal residence, and then there's certain portions of land that's vacant, nobody looks off it, maybe belongs to somebody, but there's no security in place, and so what happens, oftentimes somebody will start squatting there, it might be people that come from across the border, they set up house because where they need to find a place to live. Now, once somebody squats on your land for a given period of time, you cannot just evict them. There's laws in place to protect, and it can become quite a problem and how many of you know that disease, the disease of cancer, is an illegal squatter in your body? Arthritis is an illegal squatter in your body. Alzheimer's dementia is an illegal squatter in your body. Disabilities is an illegal squatter in your body, being demon oppressed, being influenced by a demon. A Christian cannot be demon possessed, but he can be oppressed by a demon. But that is an illegal squatter. And Jesus is saying, I'm giving you authority to evict every illegal squatter in Jesus' name. Your assignment comes with authority. 
Not only does our assignment come with authority, it comes also with some good news. Amen. Jesus says in verse 7, as you go, not yet, he doesn't say when you go. He says as you go, as you go about your life. I like that, isn't it? Yes, in Matthew 28, he says, now go and, and tell and go and preach. But here he says, as you go, as you go about your normal life, as you go to work, as you go to school, as you go to play sports, as you go to the gym, as you go shopping, Rita, wherever you go, as you go, preach the good news that announces the kingdom of heaven is at hand. What is the good news? The good news is you don't have to be subjected to sickness, to diseases, to death, to disabilities, to demons anymore. That's good news. And I think sometimes we as a church, we lose the sense of good news. Isn't that good news? For the person that is carrying a disease, isn't it good news that God can heal cancer? And we've got testimonies, three over the last six months that God had healed cancers. Three confirmed healings. Come on. Isn't it good news to a person that carries a disability, be it a physical disability or being emotionally or mentally disabled for, for, for whatever reason, that, that we, can, we can evict that illegal squatter? Isn't it good news that a person who is demon oppressed can be delivered? It's good news. And even the dead can rise. Here's verse 8. Jesus says, you receive without pay or without paying, give without pay. Acquire no gold or silver or copper for your belts, no bag for your journey, or two tunics or sandals or a staff, for the laborer deserves its food. So your, your assignment comes with authority, it comes with good news, but it also comes with provision. <laughs> we got guys, he provides. If it's got vision, he brings provision. As it God's bediening is, then is a voorsiening. Come on. If it's His will, He pays the bill. If He orders the pizza, He will pay for it. You see, God said to Moses, I I'm giving you a call. I'm giving you a vision to lead five million Jews through the wilderness. And because He gave the vision, God gave the provision. He fed them for 40 years in the wilderness. God calls Peter, James, John, and Andrew to become fishers of men. He says, but before I do, cast your nets deeper, take go about deeper and cast your nets once more because I want to pay your debt, I want to release you of all your debt so that you can be free to serve me, to follow me. The fourth thing that happens with our assignment, your assignment, hallelujah, comes with persecution. More than half of the chapter, the rest of the chapter, Jesus just speaks about persecution. And I won't do you justice or the passage if I don't highlight that the call, the, the assignment on your life comes with pressure because persecution indicates pressure. It means pressure. It means pain. And most of that pain comes from people. You see, Jesus, if you read the book of, of Matthew, Every single chapter is filled with persecution. Every single chapter. Jesus does something, he heals somebody, then he's persecuted by the religious crowd. Big crowd comes to Christ, he's persecuted. Every single chapter of the gospel is filled with how he was persecuted. You read the book of Acts, how the apostles, the disciples that became apostles, how they fulfill their assignment, their calling. Every single chapter, God does something, persecution come. God does something, persecution come. God does something, persecution come. You know, we've, we've preached a form of a gospel that doesn't include persecution for too long. We've, we've preached a feel-good gospel that says if you just accept Jesus, then all your troubles will go away. I don't know about you, but it didn't happen in my life. Maybe it's true for you, it's not true for me. The more I follow Jesus, the more persecution comes. But Jesus was the one who said, when you are persecuted for doing the right things, when you are persecuted for righteousness sake, begin to rejoice, because great, great is your reward in heaven. Great is your reward in heaven. Now Jesus lists, he lists the persecution in Matthew 10. And as I'm reading it, I said, Jesus, please stop. Because what you're saying is too true. 
Dit is te waar. Dit is te seer. It's too real. He said, you're going to, some will reject the message that you bring. Number verse 14. Verse 16. Some will take you to court. Some will lash out at you in church. I just added church. It said in the synagogues, they will lash you. You come to church and somebody beat you. Quar, quar. Okay? Come on, how many of you have been beaten and bruised in church? How many of you got hurt in church? <laughs> Some will drag you before the government, before the councils. Verse 18, Jesus says this in verse 18. You'll be dragged before governors and kings for my name's sake. Listen to this. What's the purpose for my name? Say, to bear witness before them and the Gentiles. And when they deliver you, begin to count here. Do not be anxious. Count how many times he says, do not fear. Be not, do not be anxious. How you are to speak and what you to say. For what you are to say will be given to you in that hour. For it is not you who speak, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. When you and I are on an assignment of the king and we get in trouble for that and we get persecuted for that, we must remember one thing. Do not be anxious. Why? Because you are not representing yourself. You are representing the king of kings and the lord of lords. Do not be anxious. Do not lose sleep, Lisa, uh, during the night, having the court case in your head, what you are going to say, how you're going to fight this battle, how you're going to respond, how you're going to defend yourself. You do not need to defend yourself because God is saying you're not representing yourself. You are representing my kingdom. You are representing a higher order. And I will give you the words in the moment and nobody will have to ref be able to refute the words that you speak. If you come up with a reasoning and an argument in your own wisdom by thinking through it logically, other people can come up with a better logical argument. But if in the moment, by the Spirit, I give you an argument according to my superior intelligence and my superior knowledge and logic, nobody can refute your argument. You are not representing yourself. Barbara, the army, Denver, you are not representing yourself. You are representing my kingdom. Jesus goes on with his list. He's giving us more, more persecution. He says, some will betray you. And then he qualifies. He says, mothers will betray their children, fathers their children. Sons will betray their parents. Brothers will betray one another. Now it cuts deep because it's our own relatives. Some will hate you, verse 22. Some will demonize you. A disciple, Jesus says, is not above his teacher and a servant above his master. It is enough for the disciple to be like his teacher and the servant like his master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebul, that means a demon. It actually means Lucifer himself. They call Jesus... Lucifer, Beelzebub. How much more will they not malign those of his household? In other words, if they call Jesus a demon, they might call us a demon. I remember growing up, my parents pastoring a charismatic church in a small town. At, at school, we were called the people from the sector. The people from the sect. Hey, people demonize you, right? And they, they will do that. As part of the persecution. But Jesus says this in verse 26. Number two, he says, So have no fear of them. The second time he says, Have no fear. Don't fear. Kind of goes with Pastor Andre Simon last week, anxiety. Have no fear, for nothing is covered that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. What I tell you in the dark, say in the light. Just what I tell you, just say that. What you hear whispered, proclaim on the housetops. And do not fear. Number three, those who will kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. God is saying, fear me. Fear God. Because if you fear God, you don't have to fear man. Proverbs teaches us, he says, the fear of man is a trap. 
We cannot fear man and God at the same time. If we're going to try and please people, we might not please God. But if we please God, then we might not please all people, but we will be righteous before God and people. And so we, we need the fear of God to come in our hearts. God is saying, don't fear man. Don't fear those who, who can kill the body but can't kill your soul. Don't fear. Come on, somebody needs to hear this message this morning. Don't fear. Don't fear the persecution. Verse 36, Jesus says, and this is our inner one, and a person's enemies will be those of his own household. Now you understand why I love my mother-in-law so much. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. <clears throat> At one point, now this can sound like Jesus is saying we need to write off our family. That's not what he's saying. There's a comparison. We sang this morning, we said, Jesus, I love you more than anything else than anybody. Nobody is more important than you. At one point, Jesus is busy with his ministry. It's at that point where they, where they accuses him of being Beelzebul, being filled with a demon. And his mother and his brothers come, and, and they want to, to, to reprimand him, and they want to say, stop doing what you're doing. You're going to get yourself and us in trouble. And his disciples come to him, and he says, your mother and your brothers is here. And Jesus says this, who is my mother and who is my brothers? Isn't it those who are doing the will of my father? Who is my mother? Who is my true family? And Jesus is saying, it's those who with me own the assignment of God on our life, who own our kingdom assignment. That's what makes us family, not blood. And it doesn't mean we write off our family. That's not what I'm saying. But God is saying there's a higher loyalty in the kingdom. The loyalty is to our king. Our alliance, our allegiance is with the king and the assignment that he has on our life. That's our first loyalty. And second to that is our family loyalty. Does that make sense? But a lot of persecution will come from our families even in this time. And Jesus warned us. And it was true for him, it will be true for us. Okay, lastly, number five, with your assignment comes a price tag and a reward. A price tag and a reward. Whoever receives me and whoever receives, sorry, whoever receives you receives me, Jesus says. Whoever receives me receives the Father who sent me. The one who receives a prophet because he's a prophet will receive a prophet's reward and the same for a righteous man. Each assignment comes with a price tag, and that price tag includes this persecution. Big part of the price tag is persecution. Why is persecution so powerful? Persecution is an essential part of your assignment. Can I say that again? Persecution is an essential part of your assignment. Without persecution, your assignment will not be fulfilled. God doesn't cause the persecution, but he's using the persecution. Let me show you how. Jesus says this, he says, when you are persecuted for doing righteousness, when you're persecuting for doing the right thing, when you're persecuted for, the, for following the assignment of God in your life, he says, what must you do? You must rejoice. Why rejoice over persecution? He says, because great is your reward in heaven. And then he adds to that, qualifies. He says, I want you to love your enemies, not just your neighbor, but love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you why if this this plank is, is, a, is representing a balanced scale right if i were to put brother isaiah he's he's about double my weight not truly but he's, he's a little bit heavier than myself i wanted to use pastor Garth, but he's no so lich, you know <clears throat> if i put if i put Isaiah here, or down on this side of the scale, and I stand on the other side. Do you think I will be able to lift him? Okay, it's not going to work, because he's got more weight. It's going gonna, it's gonna to take much more weight to lift Isaiah than what I have. There are certain people that we are praying for to get saved, but our prayers are not heavy enough. Our prayers is too lightweight. Our love is not heavy enough to lift them. 
The only way I can lift Isaiah on a scale like this is if I move the center of balance. We call this the fulcrum. If I move the fulcrum towards Isaiah, then I can, with much less weight, I can lift a heavier weight on that side. That's how, what we call the principle of leverage, right? Jesus is saying this. This is masterful. He's saying this. When people persecute you, the fulcrum is already shifted. When people make themselves your enemies, they've already moved the fulcrum towards themselves. And when you pray for those who persecute you, there's not many prayers needed. All you have to do is, God, I bless my enemies. I love my enemies. I pray for them. I pray for their salvation. I pray that they would come to you. Show your love to them, oh God. And in the middle of persecution, when we pray, our prayers are so much more weighty. Our prayers carry so much more weight. Our love carries so much more weight. And so that boss and that colleague of you that persecute you, that relative that persecute you, that person at your school, at your department that persecute you, God is saying this is an opportunity of a lifetime. I'm upsizing your prayers, the power of your prayers. You don't even need complicated prayers. You don't even need eloquent prayers. All you need to do is begin to bless them, begin to release the love of God to them, just release salvation towards them. If anybody else prayed for them, it might not make a big difference. But if the one who is persecuted pray for them, it will change their lives. The book of Acts tells of how Stephen was the first martyr and how he preached the gospel with so much power and conviction that the religious crowd could not withstand it. And his face was glowing with the glory of God, but they got so angry, cut to the heart, that they stoned him to death, dragged him outside of the town and stoned him to death. And those who stoned him cast their clothes, their cloaks down at the feet of a man named Saul of Tarsus. You see, Saul was appointed and appointed himself as the judge, jury, and the executioner of Stephen. Right? And what did Stephen did when, when the glory of God was shining on his face and he looked up to heaven and he said, Father, just like Jesus, I'm going to pray for my persecutors. I'm going to pray for my enemies. Forgive them, Lord. Forgive their ignorance. They don't know what they're doing. And as Stephen is praying that, the fulcrum shifted towards Paul. Saul was, would become Paul. As, as Stephen prayed that, his prayer and his, his, his death became the seed that saved Saul. And Saul became Paul and the persecutor. <clears throat> The persecutor became the greatest promoter and preacher of the kingdom and advancer. He led more people to Jesus than anyone else. He planted more churches. He reached many more nations than anyone else. Jesus says, rejoice when you are persecuted. Because when you are persecuted, it opens a legal portal in the heavenly realms into somebody's heart. If you get angry, nothing is going to get done. If you jump up and down on the scale, it won't tilt. But if you start praying, if you start blessing, if you start loving, God says, don't waste your persecution. You see, when we get persecuted, we want to give up. We want to give in. We want to run away. But God is saying, no, 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 no. Don't do that. Don't, don't waste your persecution. It's so precious. It's so powerful. Don't waste the persecution. <clears throat> One thing we need to do when we're in persecution, while we're fulfilling our assignment, I believe, is just give a bigger yes to God. Just give a bigger yes to Jesus. I see that all over the... The disciples, the apostles, they were not, they were not 
thrown by persecution. Jesus was never thrown by persecution. Sometimes he would react and ask a question. Sometimes he would challenge. Most of the day he would just continue, just do what he does. He just gives a bigger yes to his father. Same with the apostles. They get flocked, they get back up, they preach immediately, they preach again. They get imprisoned. The, the angel comes, unlock the door in the middle of the night. And he goes back into the city and preaches the next morning. You see, whenever you persecute it, pray, yes, love on your, your enemies, and then give God a bigger yes. 